Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and I've brought together to kick off the new year two amazing women adventurers, Ross Savage and Jan Reynolds. They're coming to us from either side of the Atlantic. Jan is in Vermont, where the connection, I'm afraid, is a little iffy, so I hope you'll bear with us. And Roz is speaking to us from England. Roz Savage, MBE, is a British ocean rower, environmental campaigner, and keynote speaker. She holds four world records for ocean rowing, including the first woman to row solo across three oceans, the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian. Roz is a United Nations climate hero, a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society, an international fellow of the Explorers Club of New York, and has been listed amongst the top 20 great British adventurers by the Daily Telegraph. In 2010, she was named Adventurer of the Year by National Geographic, and she was named a member of the Order of the British Empire in the Queen's Birthday Honors List of 2013. That's her MBE. Her second book is called Stop Drifting, Start Rowing, One Woman's Search for Happiness and Meaning, Alone on the Pacific. Now, Jan Reynolds is a wilderness photographer, writer, speaker, and champion of indigenous people. Jan traveled solo over the Himalaya, Sahara, Amazon Basin, and more to live with Tuareg, Tibetan, Samis, Aboriginals, Yanomama, Inuit, and Mongols to record and research their ancient cultures. She is also a high-altitude, record-setting skier and mountaineer who participated in the first circumnavigation of Everest, climbing and skiing between 17,000 and 24,000 feet. And three years later, she flew a hot air balloon over Everest, setting an altitude record and creating the award-winning film Flight of the Wind Horse. Never shy about competing with men, Jan has been a member of U.S. biathlon teams and was a mountain man triathlon champion in the 80s. Her latest of 17 books for children and adults is High Altitude Woman, From Extreme Sports to Indigenous Cultures, Discovering the Power of the Feminine. First of all, I want to say how tickled I am to get you both into the same virtual room, considering that Jan is in Vermont and Roz is in the UK. So feel free to ask each other questions. And I'd like to kick off, first of all, by welcoming you and by posing this question. You have both been absolutely over-the-top achievers in extreme sports dominated by men. Was there anything that you could point to in your upbringing that planted the seed for your later adventurers? Why don't we start with Roz? Wow. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. Such a pleasure to be talking with you and Jan today. I've been really looking forward to this. Um, was there anything in my background that um, suggests that I might one day be an ocean row? Really not at all. I was um, terrible at physical education at school. <laughs> I was um, short and uncoordinated and always the last to be picked for a team. But then when I went to university, I thought I really should do some sort of exercise because I basically wanted to be able to eat more without getting fat. So this is my extremely superficial reason for taking up rowing. Uh, but I actually took to it like a duck to water, just found that I really enjoyed the early mornings out on, on the river. I enjoyed the camaraderie and the, the team spirit. And uh, that was really when I developed my love of rowing. But then when I graduated and went to work in the City of London, I really just didn't have time for the rowing anymore and so gave up on that and it was only when I was having my kind of early midlife crisis in my in my mid-30s that uh, the idea of rowing bumped into a few other ideas and I became an ocean rower. Wow. Well for me I guess hi everybody this is Jan nice to meet you Roz and hi Miriam. <laughs> I, I, I think for me it's fun fun, pure fun. And as a kid, I grew up on a dairy farm in Vermont. I was number six of seven. And the only way you could play with the older kids is if you just didn't whine, you didn't cry, you didn't fuss, then you had way more fun. You could play with the big kids. 
And so, as a matter of fact, my older siblings used me as a guinea pig for all kinds of experiments because they realized I would do anything to stay in on the fun. They wrapped me in a blanket and I rolled down the stairs um, <laughs> from top to bottom. We, in the hay mow, they pulled out the hay bales. So I went down, we would do this all together. You're blindfolded. I mean, all of us did it at different times, one at a time. And it was like this maze in the hay bales. And what they did was they, they pulled out a bale so that when I was moving in the dark, just in a tunnel the size of a hay bale, all of a sudden, I, I crawled out into open space and fell 30 feet. And they'd all go, Jan, Jan, what was it like? Just like when I rolled down the stairs in the blanket and I come out and they go, Jan, Jan, what was it like? And they put me in a tractor tire. And they, they said, let's see if you can stay in there while we roll it. And I'm not sure they really meant to do this. And they, I, we got going so fast, I ended up rolling down a hill and into a four-way intersection, tipped oh, no. over and went round and round like a dime, you know, spinning. I couldn't put an arm or a leg out. I'd, it'd get broken. Same thing. They come round and down the hill. They go, Jan, Jan, what was it like? So I have a friend who just laughs and laughs. She says she thinks the way I grew up on the farm, plus... I had amblyopia. I was so cross-eyed, I looked at the end of my nose. So when I, it, it was fixed when I uh, was in school later on, but um, with eye operations, but they said being cross-eyed, growing up on a dairy farm, number six of seven, that expeditions were nothing compared to <laughs> <laughs> when I was little. So I'm not sure if that was it or not, but I do, my oldest sister, who's 10 years older, did say, recently it took till now to come out she goes you know what you would never cry we used to try to see if we could make you cry and you would never cry oh, wow. <laughs> i don't know if that's true i don't know if that's true but we had a good laugh over it so i don't know nature or nurture i was probably pretty independent anyway and uh i know that working with all the guys on expeditions it's a similar kind of thing i mean you're not going to whine or complain or you're all in it together you put up and and go for it sounds like jan is living evidence that what doesn't <laughs> makes you stronger <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely amazed that she survived childhood <laughs> But uh, as you say, it sounds like perfect preparation. So, Roz, l going from the city of London to uh, being alone on an ocean, how did you decide to make that transition? Well, I had this increasing feeling that there was a mismatch between the person that I was on the inside and the person that I was pretending to be um, in this role as a management consultant uh, five days a week. And what really brought that home to me was after a particularly desperately miserable day at work, I came home and wrote two different versions of my own obituary. It's kind of self-help exercise that really can change your life, actually. So I imagined that I was at the end of my life and looking back and just considering whether I'd used my time on this earth usefully. And um, the first version was the fantasy version, the way that I wanted to be able to look back over my life. And the second version was the one that I was heading for if I actually carried on as I was. And I realized that they were incredibly different and that I needed to do something, uh, really a big course correction in my life or else I would end up with regrets for the, the paths not taken. And um, I wish I could say that I immediately turned my life around, quit my job, um, but actually it took me a little bit longer to wean myself off the trappings of my old life. Jen, you were turned on to, um, I guess, service to the world through your visits to indigenous communities. You've had the most amazing world view, world overview, I should say. Tell us how you got into that. Well, I, I was climbing and skiing around the world, and a, a little unlike Roz, I just couldn't do something that didn't feel right to me. So I did go to school, I did get my teaching degree, and then I said, you know, I was racing um, 
on a national level and I just said, mm, you know, I got to teach skiing for one year before I get that real job. Well, you know, I still haven't gotten that real job. <laughs> but um, so then I began uh, because I, I taught skiing with these um, men that were climbers out in Yosemite in California and they would come to teach skiing in the winter in Vermont. So I could kick their butt skiing. So they taught me to climb and I ended up going on these um, they invited me on an expedition and we did well, we were successful, and then it just carried on from there. So I did the expeditions with all these guys, set world records, climbing and skiing in the Himalaya, Pamirs and whatnot. But it was the people that I met in the nooks and crannies of the world that really captured my imagination. So when we were working with and sponsored by National Geographic and I ski off this 25,000 foot peak and set some records, but it was the Kirkis living in far western China where it used to be former Soviet Union, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and China all came together like the spoke of a wheel. And the Kirkis were just, it's Xinjiang is the prophet, province, and they were just unbelievable. Uh, China hadn't even gotten wires that far. There was no communication. We we're talking life like Marco Polo, they still had the markets, they still had the mud brick homes and the Kirkis were out in their yurts and their yurts were still made with real felt from their animals, um, you know, the pressed animal hair. They were still living very traditionally and it just, it just captured my imagination and I started to experience and feel I thought, this is how I describe it, is it, the brotherhood of barter because I lived in a time when so many people so far out with these indigenous people, when you don't have money, you trade for the things that you need to survive. Mm. And again, sort of think, sort of Marco Polo, and in that sense, your life is open to people that you meet that come from another land that may look strange or whatever. In today's world where we can work in our a cubicle, order things online, drive in our car, you know, we can, if we want, never talk to anyone. Whereas for indigenous people that aren't using money, that are still trading, the brotherhood of barter, you you meet people. It's so obvious that you need people to survive. And I, I this is my idea, my theory, why they're so good to each other is because it's so evident in their lives that everyone needs everyone to make it and i think spending time with these indigenous people and literally not just thinking this but, but feeling this and actually trading with them and living with them and then spending time with the tibetans a lot of time with the tibetans on an ancient salt trade route which is another thing that national geographic sent me on and i experienced in the salt trade again the brotherhood of barter but the idea of being buddhist and compassion and service are key in their lives and so it those were the wonderful things that i brought home that seem to make me feel the happiest when i connect with other people and when i have something to offer to other people i know it sounds so pollyanna and in a way does it do something for other people or is it just self-serving that i'm of service because it makes me feel good <laughs> who knows but it's what works for me so it, it was a gift living with all these indigenous people to be taught that and bring it home how fascinating now Roz you went to the other extreme and you were rowing literally across an ocean solo um, how did you feel in the in this kind of uh, introspective uh, turned in on yourself environment Wow. Well, um, to put it in context, when I set out across my first ocean, the Atlantic, um, I had experienced this amazing kind of spiritual realignment in my life, having decided, as, as Jan says, that being of service, like doing something useful in the world, actually made me feel so much happier than I had been when I was working in that office, doing a job I didn't like to buy stuff I didn't need. And um, so I was really just full of the joys of the, the new spiritual um, warrior. And um, once I'd 
fixed on the idea of rowing across oceans. It had just absolutely amazed me, the serendipities and the, the people who came forward to, to help out just at the right time. And so I was kind of riding high on this, this wave of spirituality and absolutely loving it. And almost, it felt like I could <laughs> wave a magic wand. I could almost manifest anything that I needed. And then I head out onto the ocean and run slap bang into a very brutal reality. Um, I'd picked the worst year to row the Atlantic. It was the year of Hurricane Katrina, and there were more tropical storms in the Atlantic that year than any other year since the weather records began. And you know, everything was breaking. I had tendonitis in my shoulders. I had salt water sores on my derriere. I was just really struggling. And I guess it's that sort of classic hero's tale, isn't it? You know, the, <laughs> your hero sets off with this great big noble quest in mind, but then they have to face that adversity and boy did I face adversity and for a while I was really frustrated by this I was like what did I do wrong universe you know here I am trying to be useful in the world <laughs> and this ocean is giving me the hardest time and I don't deserve this and yeah you know, I was almost a bit of a crybaby for a while I was I was terrified I was so far out of my depth literally and metaphorically it wasn't even funny um, and I just had to realise that actually um, the world had not stopped being a spiritual place. You know, the, the ocean was not rearranging the laws of physics just to teach me a lesson. The ocean was just, just doing what oceans do. And I had to get on and do what rowers do. But I think I still found the ocean, for me, it could be a beautiful place, but I don't find it a spiritual place place because my kind of spirituality I think depends on that connection with other living beings and now that we've killed so many of the living beings that were in the oceans it's really quite an unusual day when you have an encounter with some big marine creature mm -hmm. so I actually found it quite tough out there because there wasn't that opportunity for serendipity and connection and that energetic exchange that you get when you're around sentient beings and I, I really miss that but by forcing me to turn inwards and learn how to deal with mostly myself I mean yes it was learning how to deal with the ocean but really by far and away my biggest problem was me and really learning how to manage my emotions and my thoughts and Jan just mentioned Buddhism I reminded myself I'd been reading about Buddhism and I had to remind myself about not being too attached to outcomes and you know, really just sort of observing what was happening rather than being so caught up in the emotion of it. So it was immensely character building and mm -hmm. it took me three and a half months to cross the Atlantic. Um, three and a half months of sheer hell. But <laughs> <laughs> by the end of it, I was definitely uh, much more mature, much more seasoned, much more capable and I'd really discovered strengths that I never would have known were there if I hadn't put myself through that grueling test. It's kind of a watery version of a hermit's cave. Well, actually, very much so. There was a book that I'd read called um, Seven, Years in a, uh, Seven Years in the Snow? A Cave mm -hmm. in the Snow, sorry, I beg your pardon, which was written by a British woman who became a Buddhist nun and spent the best part of seven years in a cave in, in Tibet. And I found that such an inspiring, beautiful story that I guess I was looking for a version of her cave or, you know, Walden Pond. I was looking for that solitude and opportunity for contemplation. Yes. I, I remember from your book, Roz, that you had a, like a colony of well, uh, some bird, boobies or? <laughs> boobies, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it was so amusing to, to feel this kind of internal conflict in you between appreciating the company <laughs> and being devastated by the smell of their poop. Oh, they were appalling. Yes, uh, definitely the worst crewmates I could ever have had. Uh, yet normally, of course, you know, I'm very respectful and loving towards wildlife. But really, in the case of the booby birds, I think I would have to make an exception. <laughs> they were so smelly and so noisy and so stupid. I mean, you would have thought that most creatures could somehow be trained.
that, you know, if I shoved them off the bows of the boat often enough, they would get the hint that they were not entirely welcome. But no, they were not getting the hint at all. They would just fly around in a big circle and, and come right back again. But um, I think one of the lessons that I learned on the ocean is learning to focus on the things that I can control and just accept the things that uh -huh, I can't, uh -huh. you know, as right. St. Francis of Assisi said. And definitely the boobies were something that I could <laughs> not control. So I just had to resign myself to their um, rather obnoxious emissions. But then actually, um, they left about a month later and in a bizarre way, I kind of missed them. Yes, yes. Roz and Jan, you both found yourself um, in uh, Latin America and indigenous communities. It's, it's interesting that you both um, had this perspective. Um, Jan, tell me uh, what you feel is the most um, critical threat to their civilization. Well, uh, I, where I was, I'm thinking of South America. I was with the Yanomama, and uh, they're the largest primitive tribe still remaining on Earth. They haven't invented the wheel yet. When they count, they say one, two, and after that, it's just many. And um, when I was with them, I had the experience of actually losing track of time, and it's the first time I ever experienced that. We watch the clock, we go to school, we have meetings, we literally watch minutes. For these people who don't count, uh, it was this, this feeling of continuity, the continuity of life. And one day just leads to another day, which leads to another day. They don't know how old they are, obviously, if they don't count. And the biggest threat to them, obviously, is the outside world coming in. Now, this is a very tricky concept and people are on two, you know, each side of the fence here. Some people feel that these indigenous people should, should be taught the language of the people, the first world, the developed world around them, so that that would give them the option to be able to work in politics, to keep their land, to be able to manage their own lands. Other people, uh, more the academic community wants to put these people kind of under glass. I keep seeing that piece of cheese with that glass dome <laughs> over that when I say this. But seriously, they don't want people going in or going out and just keeping them separate. And to me, I don't really feel that that's fair or appropriate or human nature because there has always been trade. I was with the Yanomama and I was hundreds of miles into the rainforest where there are no roads whatsoever. And um, I found a pot. So I think, that, I think the difficulty is for the indigenous people if they are put under glass and the academics want to study them and they don't allow any people in or any people out, that isn't fair. It's almost like putting a fence mm. around a group, putting them in jail. That's not natural. It's not fair. People have always traded over time and interconnected. So so it really is a conundrum. Yeah. Those are the two camps. One yeah. says, mm -hmm. you know, and what what do you think language and to get into politics to protect themselves? Well, I go what I, I feel like an aboriginal man I met. And this man um, when the uh, Australians went in, the missionaries, they gave them white flour and alcohol and white sugar. And this man now, who was an alcoholic, has to get dialysis very regularly. And he's one of their leaders, and he's seen the outside world, and he's trying to get his people to understand that he hasn't gone to the first world. He just knows the first world and understands it, or I should say the developed world. And he's telling his people that they're the Tiwi, and uh, the aboriginals that are the Tiwi, and they live in an island off Darwin. And what he's trying to get them to understand is learn English. We need to understand their system so that we can own our own land and we can hire people to do the things we want. Because right now, what's happening to you, Tiwi, is you're being hired to be the pearl divers. You're the ones risking your lives, and you don't make any of that profit. 
So I think personally, I'm not on the side of the academics putting them under glass. I think it's only fair to educate the people to see what's coming in from the outside and let them make their own choices with their own leaders, how they would like to handle mm -hmm. their own land and their own lives and their own environments. Now, Canada did something pretty remarkable. They gave a province a whole chunk back to the Inuit and they govern it themselves. It's up in the Northeast and it's called Nunavut. And it's the area uh, where it, they have the most polar bears and polar bear sightings. I spent some time up there. So, so some of the governments are doing things like this, giving their indigenous people a voice and a governance over their own lands and an opportunity to make their own incomes and raise their own kids in their own culture. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing the many ways we have of degrading our environment. Um, Roz, you encountered what sounds to me like a floating country of flotsam and jetsam. Well, that's not quite true um, because um, you might, uh, your listeners might have heard of the North Pacific Garbage Patch, which, depending on who you listen to, is the size of Texas or twice the size of Texas or the size of the entire continental United States. The actual truth of the matter is that plastic pollution is being found throughout the ocean, so you could almost say it's as big as the ocean. And um, it's quite frightening, actually, when you think that we've really only been using mass-produced plastics for the last 50 or 60 years and yet in that space of time plastic has infiltrated like every last part of the ocean they're even finding plastics up in the arctic um, in the great lakes it's just absolutely everywhere and wh what i actually saw was it's certainly not an island if it was an island we'd be seeing images on google earth and all over the newspapers it's really um just little fragments of plastic distributed throughout the, the water column of the ocean because plastic never truly biodegrades. It just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. And even when you can't see it anymore, the, the substances, the, the chemicals are still there. And uh, not only that, but wildlife tends to ingest plastic. They can't tell the difference between that and plankton. And uh, the plastic actually acts as a kind of magnet for various toxins and microbes. So it's like this massive concentrated payload of um, poison on each piece of plastic. And they're finding it in the stomachs of so many fish now. Um, and it accumulates to higher and higher levels um, up the food chain until it ends up on the dinner plate of the apex predator. And mm -hmm. That's us. So I think plastic is such a great example of, on the ultimate closed loop system, our planet, what goes around comes around. We used to think that we could throw things away, but really there isn't an away. And now that there are seven and a quarter billion of us, and not only that, but we're consuming more than ever before and throwing away more than ever before. Um, if we're not careful, have you seen the movie Wall-E where, yes. where we've cluttered up the earth with rubbish so badly that the humans have had to move off into a spaceship, leaving the poor little robots to try and tidy things up down here. And, you know, if we're not careful, um, that, that could, could be frighteningly close to the reality. I mean, you, you just look at the number of garbage bags on um, the day that they come around to collect the rubbish and you just kind of multiply that up across the world and across the years and it really starts to become quite mind-boggling. And I think we need to bear in mind that some people will say well that's on the ocean or it's just the plastic but every single person listening to this radio interview probably washes their clothes and probably uses a washing machine and what people don't realize is even the fabric of our clothing and the lint that's created goes out into the streams and that has become a problem absolutely all these little all these little insidious things like that that you would never think about the lint they're finding all these things from our clothing and in all of um, all over in the streams and all the way out to the ocean and of course huge problem is the pharmaceuticals that we constantly think 
well, there's no way for them as well because we eat them and they end up in our uh, toilet and our water system and, and then in every other creature. Mm -hmm. So we're, I know this is probably not the happy talk you want to have, but since we're dealing with, you know, what Roz is talking about in the garbage patch and whatnot, it's not just in the ocean, it's everywhere. And we're the guilty party. So both of you, in your own way, have been working to raise awareness. Um, feel free to jump in, either one of you. What do you think um, the average individual can or should do to start turning this around, or do you think it's too late? Uh, Vote with I your dollars. Yeah. Oh, oh. Go, for, go for it. No, no you go first. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I'm going to agree with what you're going to say next, but um, I think the first thing for people to understand is that their action really does make a difference. I've had people say to me, well, I'm just one person out of these seven and a quarter billion. How can my actions really be at all significant? But I am a real, I think there are two really important levels to this. One is um, I'm a real believer in tipping points and that the more people we recruit to the cause, the more people who are behaving in an environmentally responsible way, we kind of change what's normal and socially acceptable so that maybe we even need to adjust our concept of hygiene because at the moment you know we're obsessed with everything being completely germ free so we'll use something once and throw it away rather than risk um, some horrendous germ being on there but in fact to me that's environmentally so unhygienic to be so wasteful of our resources and so negligent of where our detritus ends up so really everybody's actions do make a difference and they do accumulate and the, the metaphor I use for this is that it took me about five million oar strokes to row across these three oceans and one oar stroke only got me a few feet but it needed every single one of those five million. Good point, very good point. So I think I, what people can do, I, I would say vote with your dollars go ahead there's an organic I work with kids all the time so I switch from writing for adults to writing for children because I found it's very hard for adults to change their lifestyle their way the way they live they're locked into their income their cars their commute so I wanted to reach children before they made those major decisions in their lives and before they became quote unquote locked in and so Working with kids, one of the things I really try to impress upon them, even though they can't vote now, if that they can't walk in and uh, cast a vote uh, for politicians, they can vote with their dollars. And whether yes, we can we can vote for those politicians, but we everyone can vote with our dollars. Everything we buy, we can lean yeah. towards a more sustainable choice or not. Absolutely, and we don't do that. So and yes, of course, reduce, recycle, reuse. But you know, where is a way? <laughs> you know. Right now, Jan, I'm I'm aware that you have a time constraint. So I'd like to ask you what you would like to leave with the listener. What is the message that you feel you'd like to get out into the world through this interview? Well, there's a couple of messages. One, I think you found me through my book. And in my book, as a woman working with all men, I, I, I talk about this in my book. We haven't touched on this because it's not something that Roz and I share so much. I worked with a team. She worked alone, but I worked with all guys. And we are our hormones. Our hormones are our chemicals in our brains. And our brains... Um, Working with these chemicals cause different responses. Men and women are different. And I could go on and on and talk about that, but the message I want to leave in the end is that I would love to be that voice in every woman's and little girl's ear that you've got this, you can do this, you have everything you need to accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish. So. It has been proven in social science and with that data that if a woman is given very clear, positive feedback about the job she's doing, 
she will have all the confidence in the world. So I want to be that voice that's constantly saying, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And that support, hopefully, will allow all girls, all women to go for it. <laughs> and then some of the other things that we were talking about from the environmental standpoint, and as I was discussing. Well, we seem to have lost Jan. And uh, we'll see if we can pick her up again. It was made and why it was made and can you do without it and can you recycle it reduce recycle reuse right. and we'll have a revolution okay now jan um where can people find out more about you and your speaking and and your tours what's your website well it's it's my name, janreynolds.com. So if you remember my name, just Google it, I'll pop up, and I'm happy to respond to anyone if they want to find me, find my books, bring me into work in schools. I'm now working with corporations and teams about uh, getting men and women to work together as a team really well. Um, so the best, the best way to find me is janreynolds.com. Great. Jan, thank you. Uh, we'll let you go. I know you've got a house full of people. Thank you so much for making the time. And uh, I wish you a really happy new year. And now we're well, going. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Jan. Roz. Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this has been fun. It's been really interesting uh, coordinating this um, really uh, across the world dialogue. Anyway, now we get to focus on you. I so enjoyed your book. I really felt that I was out there in the ocean with you. Um, Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you get seasick. Uh, uh, okay, I, I have to admit that the, the the notion of sores on the bum was something that remains with me, <laughs> and, and the yeah, and the idea of you, religion. yeah, the idea of you rowing naked across the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's kind of a tradition in ocean rowing circles that. Um, it's, it's just easier that way, because otherwise clothes just get salty and sweaty and they chafe and, and cause problems, and obviously laundry facilities. So it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm very British, I'm normally very modest, but when you're several hundred miles from the nearest human being, it doesn't really matter too much. And actually it's quite nice to remind yourself that you are out there just another creature, really, and in fact generally one that's not very well adapted to the habitat. <laughs> Did you have a problem with sunburn? Um, not too badly. No, I had some lovely organic sun lotion from a British company called Green People, and I must use gallons of that stuff. So I wanted to make sure that if I'm absorbing all that into my body, I'd rather use organic sun lotion, and that seemed to work pretty well for me. That and a big sun hat. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so what are the audiences that you particularly address now in your environmental work, and, and what is your next adventure? Do you have one lined up? Well, I, I guess I'm still casting the net pretty widely um, with the environmental message because I think that we all need to get with the program. So I will talk to anybody and everybody about it, really trying to get this, this message across that every single action counts with everything that we buy and everything that we throw away and every journey that we take, how we choose to get from A to B, we are casting a vote for the kind of future that we want mm -hmm. for for the human race and, and well I'm, prou I'm proud to say that here in Oregon we are in the process of banning plastic shopping bags Oregon is awesome I mean <laughs> California Oregon um, Washington you're really leading the way over there and showing what can be done when we put our minds to it and it frustrates me when people say oh it's not possible uh, business won't stand for it or the economy will suffer or this or that or the other I feel like saying don't talk to me about what's possible and what's not possible I mean here I am a five foot four woman I was already in my mid-30s when I set out to row across oceans I I've done things that I didn't think were possible and I look back at when I was working in the office and realize how constrained I was by my self-limiting beliefs like oh I can't do that because 
how would I make a living? Oh, I can't do that because I'm not athletic enough. I can't do that because I'm too old. And I think human beings can be absolutely remarkable. We are capable of so much more than we dare to believe. And I'm talking spiritually, environmentally, everything. But we just limit ourselves by thinking, well, if something hasn't been done before, we don't think it's possible. But I, I love that Nelson Mandela quote, what a great man, when he said, um, I might get it slightly wrong, but um, we only know it's possible when it's done. Mm. <laughs> and I, actually, I think it was everything is impossible until it's done. And we, we look at the, the, bound, the uh, frontiers, the boundaries that human beings are breaking through all the time, individually and collectively. And if we could just apply that motivation and that energy to our environmental challenges and to our more general raising of consciousness, what an amazing world we could have. It's, it's right there for the taking and we just need to believe that we can have it and reach out and grab it. What a fantastic message. I did want to ask you, because of your kind of elevated spirituality, did you have any, what you would call, unusually uh, unusual experiences during these <clears throat> long periods of solitude on the ocean? Um, uh, unusual encounters? I think I hoped that I would. I was certainly very open to the, the possibility of some kind of, right, insight or a special moment of connection. Um, I, you would have read in my book about one particularly wonderful moment that I had more or less in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, somewhere where the international dateline meets the equator, when I was just lying on the deck of my boat one night, just looking up at the stars and having a kind of cosmic moment. But actually, generally, I, I think that the ocean has made me actually a much more pragmatic person. And um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I, I still believe in human potential, but I, I don't think that I've um, found it. Um, there, there were no moments of miracles. Mm -hmm. My little mini miracles were when I would have an insight into a way that I could just manage myself, manage the situation a bit better. And those were actually what made it a good day. Mm -hmm. And of course there were lovely encounters with wildlife as well, and that, that always made it special. But um, no, I didn't have whales coming up and talking to me or anything <laughs> like that. More's the pity. Yes. I sometimes think they'd probably be better company than some human beings, I know. But you did really find the miracle inside, didn't you? Well, it's, it's funny, the subtitle of my book is One Woman's Search for Happiness and Meaning Alone on the Pacific. And in a way, I feel like that's a bit misleading because you certainly don't have to go out into the middle of the world's biggest ocean to find happiness and meaning. And in fact, I don't think you even find them. I think you create them. And I think in this age of instant gratification, when people think they can get rich by winning the lottery or get famous by going on a reality TV show. My personal experience has been that it's actually by doing the work, by having a practice, by being introspective, by shining a light into the inner depths of my, my heart and soul. That has been so rewarding for me. It's not, for me, my path has not been like a flash of transcendent insight or anything like that. It's been just little by little acquiring the skills, having the courage to look deep inside and that is what really gives me the biggest sense of satisfaction. It's not the world records or the miles covered or the accolades. It's actually just having gone from being a, an insecure ex-management consultant whose self-esteem was pretty much down the pan after 11 years working in an environment that really didn't suit me. For me to actually come back from that and to create my own happiness and meaning as I define them, not according to the definitions of my teachers, my parents, my peers, even the advertisers and the, you know, the commercials on TV. I have 
decided what happiness and meaning and success look like by my own standards and those are the standards that I live by. Well, for someone who has spent so much time on the ocean, you certainly have your feet on the ground. <laughs> That's beautifully put. Thank you very much, Miriam. That's a tremendous compliment. <laughs> Roz, tell me how people can find out more about your books. Absolutely, yes. Um, as with Jan, uh, the easiest thing to do is to Google on my name and my website, which is also my name, will pop right up. So my first name is Roz, spelt R-O-Z or Z, depending on where you come from. Um, Savage, spelt exactly as you would expect it to be, um, dot com. Okay. And that, uh, there are links there to Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Flickr, etc., um, what a delight, isn't it? It's, it was amazing to me when I was in the middle of the ocean that even thousands of miles from anywhere, I could still post a blog every day. Isn't that cool? Um, using my satellite phone. And it's uh, a miracle to me that I did my adventuring just in the era when social media really took off. And, and that's enabled me to reach so much wider an audience than I could have done in years gone by. So it's funny how these things work out for the best. It is indeed. It just shows how interconnected we all are. Indeed. So we have been speaking with Roz Savage, the author of Stop Drifting, Start Rowing, One Woman's Search for Happiness and Meaning, Alone on the Pacific. Roz, thank you so much for being with us. And I want to thank Jan as well, the author of High Altitude Woman. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful year and take your message to millions more. Thank you so much, Miriam. It's been a real pleasure, and I wish you absolutely all the best for 2014. Thank you. You will, of course, be able to find both Roz and Jan's books on our website, ncreview.com, as well as the podcast of this show and all of our other shows. Well, I hope you'll join us next week when our guest will be filmmaker Grant Peel. He's the director of a very impressive documentary called Stand With Me. It's the story of a nine-year-old girl who decided that she was going to do something about child slavery. If you want to be inspired with what one person can do, you want to listen to this interview. And now we're going to close with our track of the week, a very moving piece called Native American Prayer from James Twyman's CD called Twelve Prayers.
was the Native American Prayer by James Twyman. It's one of the peace prayers from the 12 major religions that he set to music in 1994, when he began traveling the world and performing the concert in countries at war as the peace troubadour. James is the New York Times best-selling author of 15 books, including Emissary of Light and The Moses Code. And he's also produced seven music CDs and five films, including Indigo and the upcoming Redwood Highway. He's also the founder of the Beloved Community, a network of spiritual peace ministers around the world. James's website is jamestwyman.com. Well, that's our show for today. I do hope you'll join us next week and have a blessed week. Until then, I'm Miriam Knight for New Consciousness Review. Thank you for listening, and have a wonderful new year. Goodbye.